Hello everybody and welcome back to PTNAs. My name is Christina Previtt and I am on faculty for the Modern Management of the Older Adult course. It has been really exciting over the last several weeks because uh, Dustin and I have actually started to put together a live course. So if you guys are really liking the content for the podcast, or if you've taken the online version of the course and you want Dustin and I to kind of come down to where you guys are at, we have the live course now that is a two day, 16 hour immersive experience talking about all things Jerry PT and some of the optimal strategies for managing the older adult which is super, super exciting. I am super pumped to be offering this course in conjunction with some of the online material that we're doing. Okay, so today we started talking on the online course about practical programming for exercise groups, exercise interventions for the older adult. And what can be really challenging with trying to figure out what the best types of exercises and the best dosing of exercises are is that as we get older, our lives and the medical history can get a little bit more complicated. And we've talked about this a lot on the podcast where it isn't necessarily like when we're an infant and we have these windows where a typically developing child is going to get these motor milestones. The rate at which people experience losses and changes in function as we get older is hugely variable. And there's a whole bunch of things that come into play with that. It's previous exercise history. It is lifestyle related factors. It is current medical diagnosis. It's where you're at in terms of your ability to have functional reserve across multiple organ systems, which is the definition for a clinical geriatric syndrome. And because of that, as therapists, we're taking a lot into account when we're trying to find an appropriate exercise program for our clients to try and increase their reserve, increase their muscular strength, increase their aerobic capacity, but also on the flip side, not allowing their joints to flare up so much because there is nothing that is going to demotivate our clients more than every time they try to exercise, their joints are killing them for days. And if we are, if they are coming to an exercise class with us or they are one-on-one -on -one PT with us and every time their, their body's getting stronger but at the consequence of that is that their joints are aching, we're probably not creating the, the strongest therapeutic alliance and we, we can probably do a little bit better in regards to exercise-based prescription. So this kind of got us into this conversation of risk versus reward. And I think especially when we're dealing with an older client, we tend to be very much on trying to minimize risk and rightfully so, right? We know that um, certain exercise interventions can increase risk for falls. We can, if a fall happens, we can have a increased fracture risk, especially with some of our clients who have moderate to severe osteoporosis. And so we never want to be responsible for those type of issues happening. Not that they don't happen, like obviously we can't mitigate everything, but we want to try and keep it as low risk as possible. But what can happen when we're trying to stay low risk is we tend to also prescribe exercises that are low reward. And this is where the conversation around you know, proper exercise dosing and the potential to underdose our clients can come from. And it's understandable because, you know, our first priority is do no harm. And so I know that it can be really challenging. I know I struggled with it a lot as a new grad, knowing that we needed to push our clients, knowing that they really needed this strength and it was really, really important for them to maintain their independence. But at the same time, I didn't want to do anything wrong or cause any pain. And so I kind of, I don't know if you can see, I'm going to try and see if I can, get into the tech, oh, I did this backwards. Okay, I'm gonna, yeah, so this is risk versus reward, right? And the way that I conceptualize a lot of the exercises that we prescribe is along this continuum. And I would say, you know, this is low risk and this is high risk and low and high, right? So we tend to cluster around this low risk this low risk quadrant, 
right? And so if we're staying along this low risk quadrant, we also can have the capacity to be low reward. So we're trying really hard to keep them safe. And so because we are doing that, we are not exactly giving them the biggest bang for their buck. And so we're trying to, you know, keep them safe, but we're also, sorry, you're hearing my dog in the background, um, giving them a little bit less reward. So when I'm thinking about uh, clinical uh, populations, I'm trying to stay as close, sorry, as close as I can to the low risk but also trying to optimize reward. So let's use the example of the squat, right? So if I have somebody with degenerative arthritis and meniscus injuries, for example, if I am doing a full squat, so fully below parallel squat, it may be a high reward because we're strengthening through range. We know that we want to try and optimize range of motion as much as possible, but we're trying, we're tending to bring this up here right? We're keeping this up at the, the higher risk because they're more likely to flare up their joints after. And we're also seeing a high reward, but it may demotivate a person, right? Because they're going to come, they're going to be like, yeah, I know that my legs are getting stronger, but it really is hurting. Like it's hurting my legs to do this. So how can we keep the reward high, but keep the risk lower? And that's where some of these exercise modifications can come into play. So we can try and see, you know, let's put them, instead of going all the way down to below parallel, let's bring them a little bit higher. So let's keep them slightly above parallel. And so then they say, okay, well, I feel like I'm getting stronger. My legs were sore, but I didn't have that joint pain. You know, that medial joint pain where it was really tender to touch. I, had, I didn't have to put Voltaren on and you're like, okay, great. So now we're keeping the high reward because we're strengthening mu multiple muscle groups. We're doing these compound movements that are going to translate into functional activities, but we're starting to bring this down. So now we're still along this high reward, but we're, our risk is a little bit lower, right? And so then you're like, okay, that's, that's better. And then you're like, okay, can, can we stay there? Or is there something that we can do that's potentially better? And that's where we can come into some of the safety considerations. So I might have somebody doing a bodyweight squat, not necessarily a sit down to a bench, but I might put a bench or a box down behind them because one, it can give them a lot of feedback in regards to depth. So I want you to feel the box on the back of your legs. I don't want you to necessarily sit on it but I want you to feel that that's the depth you're gonna go every single time and then you're gonna stand back up. The thing about this is that risk goes even lower because you're giving them feedback so that they're not sometimes going a little bit lower and going into a painful range for their knee, at least for where they are at at the time that you're seeing them. And then the other thing is that you're not afraid that they're gonna fall and it's something that we can give them at home because even if they lose their balance, the worst thing that's gonna happen is that they're gonna hit a box and they're just gonna sit. And sometimes I'll actually get them to just flop down and say, you know, this is the worst thing that's gonna happen. So don't worry, you're gonna be okay. And then what that does is it keeps the reward high again, but it, it brings us down to a lower risk. So now we are still in the low risk side. So we're kind of along this do no harm, which is great, but we're further along this reward side. So instead of being in this bottom left quadrant, we're in this bottom right quadrant. And I really like conceptualizing some of our exercises this way because we know sometimes for example, I, um, people know that I do a lot of deadlifts or rack pulls with my older clients to try and optimize their midline stability and teach them proper lifting mechanics. And I recognize that I am not in this very low risk quadrant anymore when I'm working with these individuals. It makes me hyper vigilant on their form. It makes me really recognize if there's anything that may put them at risk for fragility fracture. So I'm really screening around osteoporosis and past medical history relating to that. I will monitor range of motion so that instead of having this high risk, high reward, 
because I know that it's really important. I know that people are picking things up off the floor with poor biomechanics and they're telling me that their backs are aching all the time. How can I bring it from this top right quadrant all the way down as low as possible on this y-axis or this risk, this high risk to low risk quadrant? And the thing that's interesting about this is it depends on the client. You know, if I have somebody who's relatively active, relatively mobile, has no history of osteoporosis, no history of fragility fracture, baseline for doing something like a deadlift is going to be high still on this reward pathway, or this reward axis rather, but not necessarily as high on the risk. But if I have somebody who's in their 80s with a history of fragility fracture, with, you know, um, very sarcopenic, is fairly frail, and I'm trying to get them to deadlift on the floor, then all of a sudden there is this potentially high reward, but also this high risk, but is it worth it? So the client profile is really going to change where these exercises lie across these continuum. And so because of that, we try really hard to map this out. And so some, we do this often as clinicians because we are always thinking about risk versus reward and we're trying to optimize the function for our clients. And I think that a lot of us actually do this subconsciously. So we're not necessarily framing it like this, but the way that our mind is working when we're doing this clinical application is we're kind of weighing this out. But sometimes we do it so intuitively that it's nice to take a step back and take a look at my caseload and say, okay, oh, how am I doing? And be honest with myself. Am I just staying at low risk and I'm not really pushing the reward? So I'm keeping them safe and I'm not worried about them flaring up, but am I really pushing them as hard as they need to be pushed in order for this reward access to go from low to high? And if I am being honest with myself and I'm having too many exercises that are here in this bottom left quadrant, we want to try and focus more on this bottom right. So by kind of going through a self audit or a self check of the exercises that I'm progressing in some of my group based programs or some of one of my one on one clients who I'm working with with a more complicated medical history, then I can do a check and balance on myself and see, you know, where if we look at this as quadrants, we think we want the majority of our quadrants, our exercises to be in this bottom right hand quadrant. We want people to be in this high risk, low reward. And we may have some that are in that moderate risk, high reward piece, kind of that transient line between uh, low and high risk. It's probably the exercises that I'm gonna do right at the very beginning when they're fresh after an appropriate warm up and under a lot of supervision with much more cueing because this is where if risks are high, supervision needs to be high and my ability to modify and adapt to what the client is telling me has to be very good. And so if I know that this is kind of what I'm doing, then this is gonna be my first priority of the day when they're fresh, and then I'll probably get them going lower and lower in the risk profile as they continue through their interventions with me, as they continue through their clinical course of care, even within a treatment session so that um, I know that, you know, we've kind of done the little bit riskier stuff. I think like floor transfers. Floor transfers are going to be really high reward, but sometimes they can be moderate to high risk. But it's necessary because we're going to weigh that out and they need to be able to get off the floor or gardening is a really important um, idea for them or they don't want to rely on their husband or wife to have to pick them up who also have their own issues at home. And if they were to fall, then they'd have to wait for a really long time, call an ambulance. They don't want to do that. And so I may push this. So the reward is still high, being independent with getting off the floor, but risk is higher. So they would start, I would start the day doing something that was a little bit higher risk so that their body was fresh and not fatigued. And I was there to be able to supervise and help manage, um, manage anything from happening and try and manage that risk a little bit. So I hope that's helpful. Um, this is kind of the way that I conceptualize how I kind of teach some of my students who come in and how I, we talk a lot about this in the modern management when we're looking at the programming and progression and scaling and modifying exercise programs for individuals. Um, try and do this on some of your clients. Like just take 30 seconds to a minute and think, you know, am I too much in this low risk but also low reward? 
And what can I do to keep them in this low risk profile, but push them over into this high reward profile? So I hope you guys found that helpful. Uh, again, um, if you guys have any questions, put them in the comment below. Try and tag me as an individual. I tend to look once a day at the, the comments after, um, but I'm usually jumping into clinic right after this. So um, I hope you guys, again, found that helpful, and I will see you all in a couple weeks.